always learning, always growing. There's always room for improvement. And, um, and here I am today, and I'm the luckiest person ever to get to sit here in front of you all. So thank you so much for being here. This is Live at the Hall from the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. This week, John Osborne, half of the Grammy-winning duo Brothers Osborne, performs and discusses his musical journey, his influences as a guitar player, and his creative process in the recording studio. I, I'm one of two things. I'm either like the most prepared person in the world and I overdo it, or I'm the most unprepared person in the world. Today I'm the latter one. I've had the whole month to, to think about this. And yesterday I was like, oh my God, I have to talk in front of a bunch of people without my brother there who's my crutch. Um, but thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm just gonna wing it. And I think we're gonna do a Q&A section. Hell, I mean, we can make the whole thing a Q&A. If you just have a question, if you need to know where the bathroom is, it's just right out, right out there and, uh, and I'll help you find it. Um, but yeah, I'll kind of expand on, um, on what she said earlier. I am from Deal, I'm from a musical family. We get asked a lot, you know, how did you get into music? And it's funny, I never really thought about not being in music because we grew up around it. We didn't realize that was quite unusual. And there was always a guitar around and you know, there was always instruments around. Our parents were always playing, our parents were always singing. They were always writing, they would come to Nashville quite a lot to pursue songwriting and we thought that was normal. Initially, I didn't really want to be a musician. I wanted to be a Ninja Turtle first <laughs> and then I wanted to be an astronaut and I think both of those were equally impossible for me. Um, I think I'd be a Ninja Turtle before NASA would let me in the building. And, um, and then, so when I was a kid, <clears throat> I was a member of the, the first Deal Elementary School Symphony Orchestra which sounds great until you see the video of it. It's literally three violins playing like, God, don't tell me when it's all slow, stand on the he, he. And it was, uh, it was terrible, but we were very proud of ourselves. And um, but something about playing the violin, I don't know, I was just like, I'm a big awkward person anyway, and I was like growing by the second, and this like violin just kind of kept getting a little smaller and smaller in my hands. I'm like, I am the world's worst musician ever and then um you know it wasn't really our dad played the guitar and i thought it was kind of cool and i would kind of strum and um you know one day i just picked up the guitar and i just tried to figure out how to play a chord and which was usually like you know this is the a chord <laughs> and my parents were like very good um and I was like, that's kind of cool. I got a response. And then I fell in love with the response more than anything. Praise. And, um, and you know, I kind of I kind of just started playing guitar or whatever. You know, I, I was definitely like a, the dorky music kid because even in school when I switched from uh, violin, our music teacher was like, we don't have any upright bassists and you're way too big for this instrument. So I played the bass and I was like, ooh, this is big and comfortable and way easier. <laughs> And um, so it, uh, kind of around the same time, I was in like seventh grade, um, I don't know how old that is, was that like 12 or something? Um, and I picked it up roughly around the same time. And my mom um, would listen to a lot of Hank Sr. and she'd, she'd give me a Hank Sr. songbook to look at the chords or whatever because they're quite simple, chord-wise, they're quite simple in terms of, you know, a lot of just to, to C, F, which was a really hard one for a long time for me. And then, and that was it, so I would practice that. And I think the first song my mom taught me was Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, which is Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, Hang Down Your Head and Cry, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, Poor Boy, You're Bound to Die. This is that the whole time. I didn't realize until about 10 years later that um, I was singing a song about death, and that was the first song my mom taught me, which I think is why, um, I struggle with a lot of uh, issues to this day. Uh, but yeah, it was kind of cool, you know, and then I was able to take that and um, just kind of learn all the other chords, you know, all, all the stuff. I'm sure there's guitar players in here, you know, just the standard chords or whatever. And um, I was like, okay, this is kind of cool, you know, this, this is really neat. And then my dad taught me um, Turn the Page uh, by a Bob Seger. And, you know, getting to play along to that, hearing this guy sing, I was like, damn, this is really, really super fun and then they're like you should check out this band Leonard Skinner they're the best 
which they, I think they are. I think still think they're awesome. And they were like, listen to <laughs> Freebird. Like that's like the first song you're gonna learn on guitar. And um, but I, they're like, how does it go? Well, I didn't want to play the slow part because that's boring. I'm like, how do I play the fast part? And it's just you know. It was way worse than that, but I was like, look what I can do, and I got the whole family around, and I played the whole outro of Just the Chords, which is like five minutes long. I could see everyone being like, man, that's really good, and all of a sudden everyone's like, look at my watch, like, hey, can you get me a beer? I'm like, I'm like. And I'm like, man, I was so awesome. And then, um, and then, I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. And so, I so, the, the second big thing for me was uh, my dad plays, is my dad even here right now? I don't think he's here. Uh, oh, you made it. All right, all right, so my dad, there's my dad right there. He taught me how to play Turn the Page. And then, <laughs> um, okay, I gotta make sure I get my stories right now. Um, and then he, he would play this thing. I can't remember, he still plays it to this day. I can't remember exactly how it goes, but it was like some sort of like funky white dude rhythm thing. And it was like. I was like, that's cool. How do you do that? He showed me. And I remember taking a guitar in, this was around seventh grade. And um, I was started playing that. And there's this girl that was like watching me play. And I'm like, oh, girls like guitar players. <laughs> <laughs> Screw that stupid bass. I want to do this forever. <laughs> and um, so I, I was like, I was kind of hooked, you know, and I, I realized, and I mean, completely, this is all honest. I'm being, I'm being, a lot of it is in jest, but I realized like I had, I was just a very shy kid and I didn't really have a voice. I wouldn't really talk to people. I was, you know, I just quite a solitary person. And I can still be that way to this day, but. Um, um, this gave me a way to express myself, you know, and it gave me a, a purpose and a sense of confidence. So, you know, fast forward to, I don't know, a couple months after that, and I'm just like playing rhythm. I'm probably annoying the hell out of everybody by playing the whatever the hell that was. And my dad was like, you should check out the box scale. And I remember, since you're here, I remember exactly where it was and where I was at our cousin Johnny's house. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, they were renovating the house. My dad's a plumber, my whole family were all just kind of in, the, in, the, in trade work. And um, he's like, you gotta learn. We sat down on um, five gallon buckets, turned over, he goes, you learn the box scale, which is the pentatonic scale, the blue scale. Um, but I didn't know what it was at the time. I didn't know how important the scale was. He just showed me, which was like, you know, if it was like, like E blues. Just up. And when I learned that, I was like, what? You could do that on guitar? That's amazing. So I learned how to. And he'd be playing a rhythm. You know, I was like, all right, play. And I would just go. I'm like, that's so cool. I didn't know that there were more notes in the middle that you could also play, but I just kept playing that over and over again. I'm like, this felt like freedom to me. I was like, I could surf. But um, so, you know, I kind of got into the age of like, um, you know, around seventh grade. It was like, I don't know, mid 90s or something like that. And then grunge was a big thing. And then I was, you know, made friends with the other musicians, but they were all like skaters that wore black shirts and big jeans and stuff, of which I had none of. Um, they liked grunge and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I like this. Screw you, mom and dad. I'm a rebel now. <laughs> and I heard Nirvana, um, Smells Like Teen Spirit. I'm sure some of y'all remember that song. The song is insane. Nirvana, uh, Kurt Cobain is one of, still one of the greatest of all time. And um, I was like, <laughs> I realized, damn, that is mean. And so now I don't want to do my box scale anymore. I just want to play mean stuff because I'm angsty. And... <laughs> An individual, and uh, <laughs> and um, so I did that and became really obsessed with it. So I kind of like you know Tom Dooley and his killing himself vibe. Get that out of my face! I'm out of the world now. I guess I'm just not realizing that I was into the music from, <laughs> from a guy that inevitably killed himself. So that is also kind of weird. I'm starting to realize a lot about my own inner psyche. I'll go over that with my therapist next week. And um, so. I learned that and I got into really big into like 
um, that, uh, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, all the stuff, you know, I love Stone Temple Pilots. And then um, I started a band, it was our first band, or my first band was a band called Jackson Jive because we thought we were clever. And, um, and we thought we were amazing. And we played like <laughs> the high school dance, the um, like, I think, oh, it was the Valentine's dance. And we're like, all right, check this out. Same shit that I was doing already. And we did that for like, all right, this one is a different one. This one is in this key. And then, so we did that for a while. Man, we thought we were so cool. And we look up and all the cool like jocks and their pretty girlfriends are like, this is so stupid. And then all of a sudden we're done. Then it's like, oh, can you feel it? Electric slide and everyone's dancing. We're like, man, y'all suck. You don't even know what we're trying to say here. So I was, that was kind of, you know, I carried that, 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 uh, that envy and hurt for a long time. I'm still harboring it to this day. <laughs> and, um, and then I remember, and this was kind of a very pivotal point in my playing. Um, we had, you know, a whole, I mean, I'm sure some of y'all remember this. You have a wall of uh, VHS tapes. You know, this wasn't like DVDs where you could fit like 10,000 a wall. This is VHS tapes. You get like 20. And that's it, you know? And you just like a dip in the floor because there's so much weight and all that stuff. So I was like going through stuff and I saw this thing called Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I used to get like Guitar Player Magazine and stuff. So it was like Stevie Ray Vaughan live at the Elma Combo, which by the way, I don't know if anyone here is fans of Stevie Ray Vaughan. I'm sure we all are. But yeah, applaud for Stevie Ray Vaughan. I had a lot to do with his career. Thank you. And just, but check out this performance in particular. It's at this club um, up in Canada. There was like maybe 100 people there. And this dude is incendiary. He's on fire. It's, it's quite incredible. And I put it in. <laughs> plus play. <laughs> the sound of like the analog engagement, you know? Um, now it's like, hey Siri, play such and such and such and such. How to get directions to Waffle House. No, hey Siri. So analog is way better. And um, I pressed play and I saw this dude, you know, who just looked like an outcast. He wasn't cool looking. He was just kind of rough looking, very rough around the edges. And it was like a 90 minute set. By the end of it, the dude's standing on his guitar and shredding, playing behind his head. And it's just a three piece. And I'm like, wait, how? I didn't know you could do that on guitar. I didn't know that was a thing. And that changed everything. So I was like, grunge, get out of my face. I'm a blues guitar player now. <laughs> And I, um, you know, and then that's all I wanted to do for a very long time. I think there's a reason why a lot of guitar players gravitate to that <clears throat> is because most of us are just nerds, you know, and we are quite solitary people. We enjoy, <laughs> we enjoy just being alone. Love you, Lulu. I mean, I love hanging out with my wife more than anything. Um, but when she's gone, I'm like, all right, me time now. <laughs> And um, it gives me a way to express myself, which I find quite difficult. And I just realized, like, and it took me a long time to realize this when I was learning his stuff, you know, because th that whole thing was just this. And I was like, oh. that all kind of like worked out. I'm like, man, that is so super cool. So I became a very average blues guitar player for the next three years. Um, but it, I learned, that was when I started learning the kind of virtually limitless possibilities, I guess you would say, with a guitar. Um, and that's when I just kind of fell in love with it. I was like, okay, I can, I have a lot inside that I didn't even know I had and I was able to kind of express myself. Um, and, and it felt really great. So. Um, that happened, Jackson Jive, um, we did make it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but you know, whatever, it happened. So I left and went to Belmont University. I don't know if we have any Belmont people in here or have any people that go to Belmont or stuff like that. Yeah, one person? You go to Belmont? No. You what? You need to go there, you said? <laughs> oh, you did not go there. It's very expensive now, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's cool. I'm glad that I went. And then, um, but my parents were like, you know, there are a lot of guitar players in Nashville, which they are right, there are. I mean, probably everyone in here is a guitar player. 
And um, they're like, you should play bass. So I'm like, oh, well, but I want to play guitar. But you'll get a scholarship playing bass. I'm like, ah, oh, my grades suck, and I could use money. So I auditioned at Beaumont. They're like, all right, we'll give you a scholarship, and um, we're going to put you on probation because your grades are terrible, but you're good at music, so we'll let you come in. I'm like, all right, great, awesome. So I did bass. Um, I was you know, playing classical bass and all this nonsense. And um, I shouldn't call it nonsense, but to me, at the time, it was nonsense because I just want to rock out for the girls, you know? So girls like, man, look at that upright bassist in the symphony orchestra. <laughs> girls ain't into that. And, um, and, but also, in, in, in complete honesty, I was un unable to express myself the way that I wanted. Like, I liked improvising. And to me, like, reading this thing, like, it, there is, like, a, the smallest margin of, uh, of, I guess, improvising or, you know, playing it your own way. But it literally tells you, fortissimo, uh-uh, you ain't playing quiet, dude. You want to play this loud because it's got a big F on the paper. I'm like, I just want to play blues guitar right now. And so I did that for a couple years. But at the time, I was, uh, I was taking guitar gigs. And then eventually, I just, at that point in my life, I realized I can do it all. And kind of fast forwarding about philosophy. Um, I'm sorry if I'm boring you guys, but to fast forward about philosophy, some of the best, new, the best information I'd ever heard, the best um, uh, uh, thing I'd ever heard was be, work hard and be nice to people. And I, I used that, and I work very hard. I, I, don't know, I wouldn't be the best musician in any room, but I could tell you I work as hard as any musician in the room, and I could tell you I'm probably one of the nicer ones in the room because you know my parents, who uh, raised us to be nice and to drink too much probably. And, um, and work hard, dad's a plumber, we're blue collar as hell. And so I did that, and I just said yes to everything. And I was, you know, hey, I, I need you for a jazz, this jazz ensemble. Yeah, I'll do it. And I don't know, I don't know how to play jazz. I would need you for this one thing to play funk. Yeah, I'll do it. I don't know how to play funk. But I just said yes, yes, yes. At one point, literally at one year, I, I played bass in a prog metal band. And then the next week, I was playing guitar in a, um, in a, in a Celtic band <laughs> at a Celtic bar. And I just said yes to everything, you know, I just, because one, I couldn't get enough of it, and two, I knew like, I'm gonna prove you wrong, mom and dad, there are a lot of guitar players here, but I'm gonna win! <laughs> so, towards the end of, of being at Belmont, which was around 2004, uh, I, met, I met a Dobro player, his name is Josh Matheny, he was just recently nominated for an ACM award, one of my best friends of all time. He met a guy and was like, hey, this person wants to put a band together. Do you want to be in this band? Again, yes was the only word I knew how to say. And I was like, absolutely, we'll do it. And it was one of the greatest yeses I've ever said because that is one of the main reasons why literally I'm here right now. I can draw a straight line. So, you know, we did that. And that's where I was able to learn um, about the music industry. We got with a producer. We started doing stuff. And I was in that band for about four-ish years. And Charlie Worsham was in that band with me. He was one of my best buddies. And, um, and, and it was great. But um, so, um, I, this is gonna be my favorite part of the story, by the way. Around that time, that was, it started to take off and do some stuff. My roommate was working here at the Country Music Hall of Fame. There was a restaurant called Sobro Grill. I think it's like 222 or something, I, I don't know. Yeah, so I started working here, I'm like, perfect. I'm gonna work here for six months until my music career takes off. <laughs> and four and a half years later, I'm still working, still slinging plates and biscuits and muffins and chicken tenders, which were mad tasty and whatever. And I was doing that on the side because I was always saying yes. Yeah. So I was in the band, we were traveling in a van. I was able to work here. They were great to work on my schedule. And then I would also play for other people. So um, one of the things I would do, and I can't wait to tell you guys this, this is making me so happy right now. I would have to show up, I don't know what the hours are like now, but it would open at 10 o'clock. I would open, I would show up at eight, because there's, sometimes there's a bar, I, haven't, I don't even know if it's still out there, maybe, is there still like a bar that they leave open out there? There is, all right, still going. So I would set it up and then have like all this time like to sit down and just kind of like lose my mind. And then I just started wandering around, I'm like, hmm, what's in this room? I'm like, oh, this is cool. Man, I wonder who plays here. 
I just wandered down the stairs over there and back where that security guard is because there wasn't a security guard when I was doing this. And then I walked back there and there's a couch and it was dark and I'm like, this is where I sleep now. And I used to sleep right here before my shifts. Yes, I did. And now they're like, right to your, you're right to the, your dressing room, Mr. Osborne. I'm like, say it again. <laughs> and, and also, <laughs> also, this is another amazing, amazing full circle story. I've got so many and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but I'll tell this one. There is, I would, for, when I would work the restaurant, oh no, sorry, I would work the bar, and there was also a restaurant in there, and I, I would also wait tables, and I, all the people that work here and still work here, I waited tables on them. And they're like, hi, Mr. Osborne, I'm, I'm like, I know who you are. You like the barbecue chicken sandwich with half sweet tea and half unsweet. They're like, what? I'm like, I'm just that good, so that's no things. Anyway, so, but I would, uh, for my lunch break, well, whatever, work on the bar, I would go and eat lunch real quick, and I have like five minutes left, and there used to be a room, I think Gibson Guitar was a sponsor for it, and I would go in there, and of course I just love playing guitar, I just love noodling, I still to this day sit around and play guitar, and I would go in there and just like, pick all the guitars off the wall, because it was dark, and no one could see me, and I'm like, this is awesome, and this is long before the re renovation, and then one day I'm playing guitar, you know, probably going... Joking, I don't know what I was doing, probably playing some terrible blues or something. But all of a sudden I'm just like playing and then the string breaks. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so I'm like, I just grab it, I hang it back up on the wall. I'm like, I'm going back to the bar now. <laughs> and then the next day I show up. I mean, come on, it's just a broken string. I mean, if you're a guitar player, it happens all the time. It costs like 25 cents for a damn string, all right? So they're like, so we need to have a staff meeting. Um, apparently, someone snuck into the guitar room and vandalized one of the guitars. And I'm like, vandalized, you joking? By the way, Gibson gave you all those guitars for free because they probably had some imperfections in them. So they were gonna send them on a wood chipper anyway, but whatever. And anyway, like, but there's no more going in there and playing guitar. I'm like, whatever, stupid place. Anyway, fast forward to today, they're telling me to play guitar here. I'm like, this is awesome. It's the most full circle thing ever. That's right. For free though, so I guess they kind of win in the end. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so all that to be said, you know, around that time, band breaks up. I'm um, still working at Sobro, times are tough. My brother and I, who wrote a bunch of songs, my brother's TJ Osborne, by the way, and wrote a bunch of songs um, for that band. Um, we had a, a woman named Autumn House listen to the song, and she was like, I love the song, but I love the singer in particular. Met TJ, realized he was quite green. Um, also, side note, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but I shaved my brother's hair into a mohawk the day before this happened. We had no idea who was gonna meet a record executive, but it all worked out. And um, so they met, and it was great, you know? Like, she like, loved him, knew he was green, and like, I was, we were like, hey, DJ, I'm giving the very fast version of this because I'm sure some of you already know it. Let's get together, play some songs of yours. Everyone loves, everyone goes, we love what you guys are doing. And like, we're not doing anything. I mean, we're just doing his songs. And then eventually we were like, okay, let's form a duo. And then, you know, the, the rest is history, and my life was forever changed. Also, side note, this is our third exhibit in the uh, American Currents upstairs, so <laughs> Hall of Fame. That's right. Next year, I should give them my Sobro Grill shirt. That's what I should give them. So that was pretty much it, you know, and I still to this day, I'm growing and learning and I'm a student of life and a student of people and a student of songwriting and I no guitar player, there's no such thing as a master in music because, you know, the arts are based solely on opinion. There's no cold hard fact about whether something's good or not. If you think something sucks, you're right. If the same person thinks that it's brilliant, they're also right. So I'm, I'm always learning, always growing. There's always room for improvement. And, um, and here I am today and I'm the luckiest person ever to get to sit here in front of you all. So thank you so much for being here. How did I do? Damn, I talked for 30 minutes. All right, I did good. 29 minutes. All right, Q&A time. Y'all better tell some good long questions because I got 15 minutes to fill. 
Um, so, for those of you that are watching this later in life, or for any of you, <laughs> if anyone's ever watching this, um, so he asked the story about Stay a Little Longer and how it's the country music free bird, which that, it means a lot to me, um, and he, um, which I'll get into in a minute. And then he asked about the panhandle and our song, port, or our record, Port St. Joe. Honestly, Port St. Joe happened because our producer, Jay Joyce, um, who's produced a lot of huge records, he had a beach house down there. And he was like, do you want to just kind of get the hell out of the studio, which he spends his life in, and go to the beach house and kind of enjoy the beach? And we're like, yeah, we'll try it. You know, there's a really cool record by the band called Big Pink where they all just got in a house and recorded, you know. So it could be our version of that. So that's really it, you know. I, a strange story about Port St. Joe, though, when I was in that band King Billy that I had mentioned, we were playing somewhere down there and we got paid like 10 grand, the most money we'd ever seen in our lives. And um, I had this guitar and I lost it. And I think someone stole it. But then it turned back up and I'll never forget that. And that happened in Port St. Joe, almost at the same place that we ended up recording the record. So this guy has made um, its rounds. It was like homeward bound for this guitar. So it's kind of neat. But I, I will tell you um, the story about Stay a Little Longer. To be honest with you, that song didn't really seem like anything special at the time. We had just the first song we'd written was Shane McAnally, who's written like 5,000 number ones. He um, is a phenomenal songwriter and it was really great. And we kind of just like, we started with a chorus and it was like kind of like a one more something and a one, dun, 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 something one and a one, dun, 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 whatever. And then we wrote this chorus and we we're like, um, shoot, we've got like five minutes left to write a verse. So we just wrote like, we'll just write these verses to fill it in and we'll rewrite them later. Which we did it. So you all got five minute verses and I think that says a lot about something. You know, we have a tendency to overthink a lot of things and maybe we should learn from a lesson from that. We just just kind of, you know, something from like a strong wind, it's coming over me, it's got a hold of me. We're rhyming me with me. That's not what you're supposed to do in songwriting, but ah, whatever, worked. Went number one, so. Um, so, but the cool thing about that is, and I, and I think this is a, I wanted to talk about this, I'm glad you asked. That song um, was kind of an homage to Freebird and, and um, Hotel California and stuff like that. And that being a guitar player, and my brother's a brilliant singer, but I was like, I want to have a moment where it's just kind of like the guitar and I have a chance to, to, to sing and, and be me. You know, I'm not a, the best, like, just audible, like, verbal singer in the world, but I, I like singing from here. And then I, I was just kind of thinking about it this morning before I came over here, I was like, that solo has a lot of my heroes in it, and I, don't, I did not even know that. And what I wanted to do was write a solo that has parts and it's memorable. You know, like Freebird has the like everyone knows that. And then, you know, um, then you've got Hotel California, um, it's got it doesn't even matter, but you want to air guitar that part. So I want to write something that you could sing, and also being a songwriter on top of it, I wanted to write something that was memorable. Um, I knew, um, uh, so I got into Brad Paisley as like anyone that ever plays country guitar does, and he's, he's an incredible musician. I mean, he could play all over the place, but my favorite form of Brad is when he's playing in like the low notes, he's playing melodically. And I loved that, and it kind of just happened in the studio immediately. It was like, play something, I was like. I was like, that's a hook. Like, that could be a song in itself. I was like, that's, I went to a big, big, like, Brent Mason, James Burton kind of thing for a while. And I was like. That works in there. Also, like, guitar players. Of country guitar players all just really want to be pedal steel players, but we can't because we're too stupid. And I was like, well, um, uh, I was wondering that part too. It's like that honestly is not too dissimilar to. Which would be like the box scale, the pentatonic scale, also the blues scale, also like Steve Ray Vaughan, you know. So, this part, when I do that, that was an accident. I, don't, I was like, oh my god, what do I play next? Oh, that sounded awesome. 
And that, literally, this was an accident that, that stayed in there. And so I wrote the, the solo from a perspective of like, I want to make, because we love the song so much and we kind of knew it, it had potential. I didn't want the solo to be just gratuitous, like, like wanking, you know? It's like, oh God, that's so stupid. And, um, but I wanted it to be as special as the song. So, and I did that. And then when it goes, that that was, um, I'm a huge Almond Brothers fan. And that's like, if Dickie Betts was, had a, like a telly, was playing telly guitar, Dickie Betts like, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then, um, that was just me showing off. Um, and then I realized like, holy crap, like I didn't know it at the time, but when I was preparing for this thing, all of five minutes before I left the house, that is kind of where it came about. So I wanted to be, you know, not only a solo, solo for myself, but a solo for just non-musicians to sing and play air guitar to. So that's where that came from. Thank you. Um, anybody else? This would be the same, I think, for most people, most anybody. Um, it it kind of comes from wherever the song wants to come from. Like, again, when I was younger and I was like, girls love guitar, I just wanna like play guitar and screw these songs. And I jokingly say, um, a song is just the, um, you know, the wasted uh, three minutes around a guitar solo, um, which is <laughs> just joking, obviously. But um, I, I love songwriting just as much as I love playing guitar. It's very important to me. And I think as a, as a guitar player, as a musician, you should write songs a little bit just so you can learn like what the importance of this is to a song. And there's a guitar player, his name is Mike Campbell. He plays Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. In my opinion, is the best songwriter guitar player. Um, and that of like a George Harrison, but I think he's even better because he, you know, he can play a, you know, American Girl solo or he can just go. You're like, damn, that is sick. It's like four notes, you know, like, why? Because that's what the song needed. So, um, so honestly, it comes from wherever. And strangely, my brother has written a lot of the riffs for our band because in my brain, I'm like, I don't know, I'm like, how can I play the most notes in the littlest amount of time and really impress everybody? <laughs> and TJ wrote, uh, he wrote that, he also wrote this. <laughs> Not bad, it was just me tuning. But he, <laughs> he wrote. I'm at Rick, that is sick. He played that and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Damn it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but he wrote that too. So, and I think coming from TJ, he's a guitar player very much. But honestly, like I wrote, you know, I kind of like play, um, uh, when I'm writing guitar, I like to just kind of get in my own like chord land and pretend like I'm some sort of songwriter. And um, I wrote the entire chorus of, um, of uh, Weed, Whiskey, and Willie by myself because I was just like, I want to pretend to be Willie Nelson. So I put his name in the song. And, and I wrote that just, just with some chords because I'm like, I want everyone to be able to get up and play this song and, and sing it. So it comes from a different place every day. Sometimes it comes from a conversation. Sometimes it comes from listening to the radio. Sometimes it comes from, you know, like I have this riff. Sometimes the riff has to come after. Um, so it, literally every day it's like hunting. You don't know where it is. You just got to find it. And there's just different methods of finding it. So I had to play something. So I sat down the other day and I was like, let me just kind of write something that I think sounds cool. Um, I don't know, should I do on this one? Yeah, so this will work.
All right, thank you all so much for being here. Happy CMA Fest.